Politics for a change. I received a request to make a video on this topic probably about two months ago from a generous supporter on Patreon. I think he is actually my single most generous supporter, but I assure you my opinions on the matter have not been corrupted by this money being stuffed into my pockets by, uh, by my donors on Patreon. Uh, this is more or less the same opinion I had many months ago, but if I uh, wasn't requested to make a video on the topic, probably nobody but my girlfriend would have heard me discussing this particular element of uh, world politics right now. All right, is this unreasonable? Is it unreasonable for me to be talking about communism in the context of Corbyn and uh, the, for him, disastrous outcome of the most recent election? I do not think it is unreasonable. This is a guy named uh, Seamus Milne. I'm going to assume he prefers his first name pronounced uh, Seamus to quote this article from the FP titled Corbyn's Pet Stalinist, in a 2009 interview with his friend George Galloway on TalkSport Radio, Milne slipped into a form of wistful nostalgie, nostalgia for the former East Germany, familiar from such films as Goodbye Lenin, describing the fall of the German Democratic Republic as, quote, an important loss for many millions of people, close quote. In a column for The Guardian, written several years earlier, he argued that official communism, quote, for all its brutalities and failures, delivered rapid industrialization, mass education, job security, and huge advances in social and gender equality, close quote. Dig a little bit deeper. Here's another uh, appointee who served as one of Corbyn's, I don't know, right-hand men. I mean, these two guys, they really were standing to the left and the right of Corbyn and going through this um, process. Andrew Philip Drummond Murray joined the Communist Party of Great Britain in 1976, age 18. Well, okay, that's a long time ago. I mean, we were all young once. I mean, uh, some of us have tattoos from when we were 18 years old. We might regret, oh, but keep reading. It's not such ancient history. He became associated with its straight left faction. At this time, Murray became a close friend of Seamus Milne, in case you have a short memory, or in case my pronunciation is really terrible, that's this guy here who you saw just a moment ago on screen. So they were allies together in the same Communist Party extremist faction. Murray's allies during this period have been described by Francis Beckett as, quote, more extreme than most of the Stalinists I knew. The Stalinists were known as tankies, but Murray's lot were super tankies. <laughs> Following this... Following the dissolution of the CPGB in 1991, he was a leader of the Communist Liaison Group, which itself dissolved in 1995, with Murray and its other members joining the Communist Party of Britain. See, this is, this is not such ancient history. He, you know, even though communism was a failure, and each one of these specific communist parties was a failure, he just keeps at it. <laughs> He's indefatigable in his commitment to communism. And this is not moderate communism. This is communist extremism. Murray served on the Communist Party of Britain's executive committee from 2000 to 2004 and was an advocate of the party supporting the Respect Coalition in the European and municipal elections that year. He served once more in the party's executive from 2008 till 2011. He told John Harris in 2015, quote, communism still represents, in my view, a society worth working towards, albeit not by the methods of the 20th century which failed, period, close quote. Now you may be wondering, is this just a case of conservative exaggeration? Might it be that the FP article with the headline screaming about Stalinism within Corbyn's camp of uh, carefully selected advisors, could it just be an exaggeration? Well, <clears throat> apart from formal Communist Party affiliation, this guy Milne, there is a notorious editorial that he uh, published with the Guardian newspaper. <laughs> I did read the whole thing, but those of you who have been spending some time around the internet will um, pick up on the direction it's taking from this brief quotation here. It has become almost received wisdom to bracket Stalin and Hitler as twin monsters of the past century. Mao and Pol Pot are sometimes thrown in as an afterthought and commonplace to equate communism and fascism as the two greatest evils of an unprecedentedly sanguinary era. How would the left respond if there were an equivalent article published by the Conservative Party 
trying to bail out and flatter Adolf Hitler. Now, again, you can read the whole article if you want to. But just from this quotation on screen, you can see precisely the direction it's taking. It is trying to, say, offer an argument for the moral exceptionalism of Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot. It is trying to say that morally they are not comparable to Adolf Hitler. Well, what if somebody on the right wing who was closely associated with a candidate for Prime Minister of Britain or President of the United States, what if someone were making the equivalent excuses for Adolf Hitler? If they were making equivalent excuses for mass murder amongst right-wing extremists? Obviously, that would discredit the candidate. Obviously, that would raise fundamental questions of why did you choose this guy as your advisor? So on and so forth. Why was Corbyn so popular just a few years ago and less and less popular now? Really, the issue was Tony Blair. Jeremy Corbyn distinguished himself as the one and only voice within the Labour Party who took his opposition to Blair to the logical extreme of demanding that Tony Blair go to prison. And Corbyn was promising that if he were lifted up to become the party leader and possibly become prime minister, that he would actually press criminal charges against Tony Blair. Political power rests not on the perfection of the plans you present, but on the potential for those plans to be implemented. If the public does not perceive your promises as truly actionable, then you're not going to get elected. It doesn't matter how fine they may be, whether in broad outlines or in detail. Quote, is he going to be tried for it? I don't know. Could he be tried for it? Possibly. Close quote. Hmm. In, uh, in Canadian English, that is what you would call waffling. A as a politician, you can be right and you can be wrong, but don't ever waffle. What matters above all else is how actionable your opinions are that people believe you can and will implement your promises matters much more than how, however so utopian your ideals may be, whether in outline or in detail. Here's uh, Jeremy Corbyn making the same mistake with his promises on education. <laughs> Beneath the headline he says, uh, what I said was we would deal with it by trying to reduce the burden. We never said we would completely abolish it. Oh, this is much, much worse than mixed signals. It, it really would not be hard for me to find examples of you declaring that you were going to completely abolish it. Quote, the party's manifesto pledged to scrap university tuition fees altogether, making him popular with young people. Well, not popular enough to win the election, but we continue. <laughs> popular with young people, despite criticism from other quarters. But the manifesto made no mention of an amnesty on existing debt to the student loans company, which currently stands at 76 billion pounds sterling. Uh, and, you know, you start looking through the details, even of just the propaganda, and um, he doesn't really seem too confident or convincing uh, with this himself. I, I do not think the British people felt that this was actionable, implementable, palpable, accomplishable, real. I think they felt they were being sold a platitude and the kind of confusion, again, even just to go back to that subtitle. Well, I said we'd deal with it by trying to reduce the burden. We never said we'd completely abolish it. Yeah, you did. You were just saying that it was a human right, that it was there was going to be no tuition. You didn't just say that everyone would get six years of free university education, six years of free university education. You said you would pay them a salary while they were studying. You'd be paid wages while you were away studying. That's not just reducing the burden. That is eliminated. Well, what's this confusion? Where, where is this coming from? What's going on? And let's be honest with ourselves, guys. If you have a terrible system of education and then you remove the pricing mechanism, you get an even worse system of education. You would really need profound, systematic, intelligent reform for a new era in which the university system is no longer built around extracting tuition from students. Can it be done? It can be done. But Jeremy Corbyn did not convince the British public that he was the man to do it. But hey, 
First things last, people. If you have a textbook education in political science, this is all you need to know as to why Jeremy Corbyn lost the election, quite apart from questions of uh, communism, putting Tony Blair on trial, and <laughs> whether or not any of his election promises to hand out billions of dollars of the free education to the British people. Um, when you look at this map, you're looking at the districts that voted for and against Brexit. Jeremy Corbyn chose strategically to make Brexit the one crucial issue that this election would stand or fall on. And when you look at this map, you can see clearly what that meant was that the only places he could have possibly made progress, the only parts of the United Kingdom where he could have won more seats for his party were Scotland and Northern Ireland. <laughs> Those are the parts of the map that are colored in, indicating that they voted to remain in Europe, to remain part of the European Union, as opposed to voting to exit. If you know even a little bit about politics in the British Isles, you know that this election was not going to be the election in which the Labour Party dramatically takes over the leadership of Scotland. Scotland has its own very separate set of political preoccupations, including the Scottish Independence Movement, Scottish Nationalist Party, and Northern Ireland is even more hopeless. Uh, hey, that's debatable. Which one is more hopeless for the Labour Party? In any case, if you have a textbook education in political science, you can look at this map and say, okay, if strategically this was the issue that the uh, Labour Party chose to win on, then this is going to be the issue that they lose on because there are only some tiny little bits and pieces of England there that wanted to remain and where they could possibly gain a few extra seats. And um, that did not happen. Jeremy Corbyn, congratulations on eliminating yourself from European politics. <laughs>